students. Jeremy Black's lecture this evening is, in fact, one of a number of lectures and symposia that he will hold at nine colleges and libraries in Worcester and Boston over the next several days, all initiated by Professor Ziegler, to whom we are most grateful. Mr. Black chairs the history department at the University of Exeter in England. His expertise includes not only international relations and military history, but also historical atlases. He is the author and compiler of more than 50 books, and I think that accomplishment seems all the more remarkable to me when I consider the fact that he shuns computers and writes all of his texts out by long hand. His most, let's hear it for works include The World in the 20th Century, The Making of Modern Britain, The Age of Empire to the New Millennium, and The English Press, 1621 to 1861. And it was that title that brought Mr. Black first to the Antiquarian Society. We welcomed him that day as a reader, and we welcome him tonight, and I hope you'll join me in doing so as our lecturer. Thank you. Is not the war of independence, but it is the civil war. 
which I think is a very interesting point about America, the American way of imaging their own military history and their own, and their own relationship to war in their own past. And in fact, that's wrong. And what I want to talk to you about is the difficulties of beating Brits. And I want, in a way, this is a very pro-American lecture, it may not sound it, but it is very pro-American, because if the point is that it was really difficult to beat these people, then in fact it was an extraordinary achievement to have done so. Okay? So, let me start by talking for a bit about the strengths of the British position during the American War of Independence. Then I want to talk a bit about the weaknesses of the American position. I'll talk less about that because they're more familiar to you, or should be more familiar to you if you've read uh, the, uh, the writings of early American uh, politicians, which have been extensively published. And then I want to come back to this question of could the British have won, linking that actually to a wider issue of what one means by winning, which is an important issue that you need to consider in every war. You know, I know this sounds stupid. You might think it's obvious what you mean by winning. In fact, it's not obvious. If you think of war as forcing other people to try and observe your will, then war is a considerably more complex process than actually just capturing a capital city or beating up their arm. Um, and then at the very end, I want to close with some general reflections about the relationship between what I've been talking about and the actual nature of how we study military history, and what we've been talking about and the role of counterfactuals in American history. So that's what you're going to get. If you don't like it, discreetly walk out at this moment. I am firm believer in telling people what they're going to get. Okay, so let's start with the strengths of the Brits. And we have here this wonderful map from the collection, um, which uh, actually starts to make my point very nicely. This is America in 1775, British North America, of course, we're including Canada there. Um, it tells you the difference between America then and America now. Now, America is a constant Tending to be a country. It is a multiplicity of diversity, an enormous environment, a country that sp spreads from ocean to ocean. In 1775, it wasn't that. In 1775, everybody that counted lived along here. Okay? Roughly, there's no census, but roughly 75% of the population lived within 75 miles of the coast. And everybody that counted lived. You know, you might have prattish films like The Patriot, in which it matters what goes on in the, you know, the Appalachian back country. In fact, it didn't matter at all. Okay, the, the economically and demographically, America at that period was like Australia today. It was an urban society. You know, Australians, you go to Australia, I've been to Australia, it's a lovely country, but Australians live this great myth about being outdoor people who spend their time wrestling with the crocodiles. Rubbish. Australians <laughs> live in big cities. Okay. Now, America. In 1775, it's an urban society that is very much close to the water and is therefore curiously, well, curiously very vulnerable, particularly vulnerable, to the world's strongest maritime power, which is Britain. British have the largest navy in the world. Um, they also have a navy that has no real difficulty in operating in North American waters. Uh, sailing times across the Atlantic vary, and we're not talking about steamships, but five to six weeks will get you comfortably across the North Atlantic in that period. Um, although, um, you know, the British lose at some stages during the war, all the cities on the eastern sea of what becomes the United States, they never lose their major naval bases in North America or in, 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 uh, uh, in uh, Western waters. Do we know what the major base is? Halifax, thank you. Uh, Halifax up there is the major British base. It's never lost, never even threatened. The other major British naval base is in the Western Hemisphere and the West Indies, in uh, Antigua and in, in Jamaica. So Britain has safe naval bases from which they can operate in American waters. And of course, operating in American waters, they can evacuate troops from Boston, spring of 1776, or take, for example, uh, General Clinton, no relation, when he comes back across uh, New Jersey in 1778, fights the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse with Washington. Interesting battle for that. If you read American books, it's presented as an American victory. If you read British books, it's presented as a British victory, but we'll leave that to one side. After the battle, he comes to the New Jersey shore, 
Well, not a very pleasant place to spend much time on New Jersey shore. Water is brackish, vulnerable to fence position, doesn't matter. Just gets into the boats and sails back to New York Harbor. Equally, the British can use their control of the sea to take amphibious forces and just appear from nowhere as when they attack Savannah. Uh, where are we going? down there, sorry. As when they attack Savannah at the end of 78. Or they can use their amphibious forces and their command of the sea to cross big rivers um, that protect, otherwise protect their positions as when they take Charleston in 1780. And of course, water, I mean, the whole of the eastern seaboard of North America, the populous area of North America, is interdicted by bodies of water in the way that the western seaboard of North America is. Now, I haven't got a map here of North America, but if you look at the western seaboard, the western seaboard of North America is penetrated by bodies of water to any distance only in two places. One near Seattle and Vancouver, and secondly uh, near San Francisco. Okay, and those bodies of water don't go any great distance. Okay, well it's a bit different here. I mean, the most important body of water, of course, would always the St. Lawrence. You know, the Americans besiege Quebec, winter of 1775, uh, and what happens in 1776 when the ice melts? The British relief force just sails up. That's it. Um, further south, Long Island Sound, the Delaware. Chesapeake, big bodies of water that go a long way inland through on which ships can sail. It's worth bearing in mind that cities that we would now think of as well inland in the 18th century are actually subject to relief or being you know, reached by ocean going ships, places like Philadelphia or Albany for that matter. Okay. So America is a profoundly maritime society. And as you may know, the American continental navy is a big joke. Total joke. I mean, the privateering the Americans is modestly successful at that, but in terms of fleet action, complete failure. So that the British are able to retain strategically their ability to use the sea until the French open into sight. Um, uh, interesting that an aspect you know that America finds it very much harder to develop an effective organised naval force, and of course that still affects them in the War of 1812. You, individual victories in ship, in individual ship actions, is no good at all cannot create a fleet that is strong enough, for example, the same problem more late in 12, <coughs> a fleet that is strong enough to blockade the supplies. Okay, so what else? <coughs> Money. British have the best system of public finance in the world. They're a British state has a parliamentary guaranteed national debt. It's also benefiting from industrial and commercial expansion. So the British are able to borrow money at a cheaper rate than anybody else. And the, the government remains liquid right away through so the war's a no good problem for that, that respect. Politics? Well, the government's just won the 1774 general election. Under the Centennial Act, as the law was then, now we have five-year parliaments. And at that stage, you had to have parliament a new election at least every seven years. You could have it as often as you like within that period, but at least every seven years. So the government didn't need to face the electorate again until 1781. In fact, they faced the electorate again. They held the election a year early in 1780 and won it. So Lord North's ministry remains in complete control of Parliament until it falls um, in, in 1782. So again, domestically no real problem. What other points are worth making? Uh, well, let's talk about fighting for a bit. Um, actually, in many senses, it's a complete contradiction to the way the Americans usually think about it. The war is an extraordinarily conservative war. It's not a war that causes any real problems from that point of view. First of all, weapon. Now there is the use in that war of one device which had it worked would have revolutionised the war. Anybody like to tell me what it is? Submarine, correct. Um, a brilliant American invention. Um, and obviously if it had worked, uh, it would have made all the difference because the British used open roadsteads in places like New York Harbour uh, where the shipping would have been very vulnerable. There was as yet no effective anti-submarine doctrine or weapon. But uh, I don't know if you've seen the model of the submarine. Uh, the model of the submarine is essentially a wooden barrel, a bit fatter than I am. Uh, it's propelled by a bicycle mechanism, so the man inside it moves his feet up and down, and that turns uh, the thing at the back and moves it forward. It's armed with a giant corkscrew. Um, and the idea is that you turn this corkscrew from the inside, projects through the outside, 
and it attaches an electro, uh, sorry, attracted, attracted, attaches a mine. I mean, they called it a torpedo, but in fact it was a mine. Uh, and of course that's understandable, because ships at that time had a wooden underside, so you could literally, you know, attach it to it. And that, you know, then you would move away and the ship would blow up. And you won't be surprised, and of course it's a semi-submersible, there's no uh, breathing thing, so you have to bob along in the water then. <coughs> okay, it's a semi-submersible, it's not really what we would call a submarine at all. You would not be surprised to hear that when HMS Eagle saw this thing coming towards it uh, in New York Harbor, it was easily able to take an avoiding action. So the submarine didn't work. Um, okay, um, the first ship to actually be blown up by a submarine did not occur until the Napoleonic Wars, and that was a ship that had actually been deliberately moored in a test to blow it up. You know, see, in other words, it wasn't being chased by something. Until you had, until you had powered torpedoes, until you had um, underwater breathing mechanisms, until you have the ability to put engines, steam power, underwater, you cannot have effective submarines. So that's not until later in the 19th century. Other than that, there's no new weapons at use in that war. I mean, for example, if you contrast it with the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars between 1792 and 1815, during those wars you had the most use in the West of rockets, um, the rockets that the British, the beastly British fires, you know, books more, remember, um, you know, some other ship to land rockets, ship to ship rockets, land to land rockets, pretty useless actually, they're like giant fireworks that you could well into the famous little remarks, they were okay to frighten the horses, but that was, that was as much as they could do. Um, but at least there was something new. They also had in those wars shrapnel, semaphores, uh, the first use of, uh, of, of a system of actually moving messages long distance. Uh, there were new things in the French Revolution in Poland Wars. There's no new weapons in this war. There's no new real problem. For the British, there's no, nothing unexpected about fighting in North America. They've been fighting in North America. They know how to do it. There's nothing unexpected about counterinsurgency warfare. The British have wide experience of counterinsurgency warfare in the 18th century. They fight four counterinsurgency wars. The American War of Independence, which they lose, and the other three, which they win, against the Irish in 1798, against the Jacobites in Scotland and Northern England in 1715 to 16, and against the Jacobites in Northern England and Scotland in 1745 to 46. You know, and many of the people involved in the American War of Independence were involved in these other wars. I mean, Cornwallis, the man that surrenders at Yorktown, for example, is the commander who's in charge in Ireland in 1798. Lord George Germain, who's the, um, as Secretary of State for the Colonies, is the man ultimately responsible for military policy between 1770 and 1782, uh, had started off his period of real military experience taking part in what we would euphemistically call the pacification of the Scottish Highlands in 1746. So in other words, the British had widespread experience of counterinsurgency warfare. And it's worth bearing in mind, you will, you know, before any of you get into this idea that irregular warfare necessarily prevails against regulars, that is not inherently the case necessarily in the 20th century, and it is not inherently necessarily the case in the 18th century. You put, for example, the Russians up against Polish irregulars in both uh, the late 1760s, early 1770s, and then again in the 1790s, what do they do? They crush them. You know, there is nothing inherent. You know, we romanticize the guerrilla, we romanticize the irregular soldier, we think they're bound to be great, but that's actually not true at all. Um, and just one last thing to think about that. I mean, you can give a man a gun, but it doesn't make him a soldier. Okay, so the, the, the point about the regulars is the regulars actually have a hell of a lot of what it takes to be effective soldiers in terms of discipline and training, and many of them experience of being under fire. Now, what other aspects? Well, very, very crudely, very crudely, there are two um, strategies on offer in, to the Americans at the beginning of the war. Um, then, very crudely here, you can personalize these around two people. One of them is the strategy that is followed, which is the George Washington one. The other one is the strategy which isn't followed, which is the Charles Lee one. And very crudely, Charles Lee does in fact <laughs> recommend um, trying to avoid conflict with the main British army, trying to avoid battle, you know, attacking outlying British units, attacking communication lines, making it difficult for them to supply themselves, but avoiding going for battle. Now, if Lee's strategy had been followed, it would have been very, very difficult. Instead of which, the Americans choose the very strategy that most suits the Brits, which is to engage in what we would call position warfare. You have a position to protect New York City in 1776, 
Philadelphia in 1777. So what do you do? You put your army in the way of the Brits, which was exactly what the British want. The British want bankers. They want them because bankers enable them to overcome the problem of fixing their target and overcoming the constraints of space. Okay. And if you actually look at these battles, these battles are not being thought with like your romanticized image that I gave you at the very outset, which does describe some things. It does describe the retreat in Concord, it does describe the fighting in King's Mountain, it does describe some of the fighting around Saratoga, but it doesn't describe Brandywine or Long Island um, or uh, Camden or most of Monmouth Courthouse or Guildford Courthouse or most of the battles at all. These are battles that are fought exactly like battles would have been fought in Europe. Lines of soldiers blasting away at each other. Okay, that's how they fought. The only major difference between an American battlefield and a European battlefield is a simple one. That on the American battlefield, there is very little use of cavalry. I mean, I don't mean that the Americans don't have horses, you, but often what they do is they ride to the battle and then dismount and fight as infantry. Okay? Um, so there's very little use of cavalry, and as a result, the infantry fight in slightly more open order, slightly less close packed together. It's not quite so shoulder to shoulder uh, as they would on a European battlefield. But otherwise, you've got the same essential idea. Linear formations fire, firing with essentially low accuracy firearms in order to build up the weight of metal, firing at close range, and that weight of metal will build up a kill ratio, which hopefully will force the other side to collapse. Cause them to flee. You know, it, it's not difficult, it's not impossible uh, to win those kind of battles, and that is in fact what the Brits are up against. So, as I said, the Brits have a whole host of factors that are helping them naval strength, financial strength, <coughs> uh, political background, familiarity with North America, experience with counterinsurgency, essentially not a particularly difficult uh, battlefield scenario. Um, I mean, you know, to give you an idea, you want real problems for the Brits? Think about what Cornwallis has to do next after losing at Yorktown. The next war Cornwallis is in charge of is the um, second, yeah, the second, was it the third? That was the second Mysore War, 1790 to 92. He's in charge of the 1792 advance on Serengeti. Now that is difficult. You know, campaigning in India, the heat and the humidity, that is really difficult. Compared to that, North America is a dollar. Okay? Um, now, what other factors are worth bearing in mind? Well, secure local bases. Um, the Americans aren't able to do very much about the two colonies down the bottom. East Florida and West Florida. Well, that's the colony of West Florida. Okay, I think it's called that period. Let alone the West Indies. The British have secure bases to the south. Secure bases to the north, because although the Americans obviously attack uh, up towards Quebec, capture Montreal and besiege Quebec in late 75, they're not able to do anything about Nova Scotia, still less Newfoundland. And once they've been kicked out of Canada in 76, it's essentially stable. I don't think it's completely stable, but it's essentially stable. <coughs> so there are secure bases on the front. Is that very important? Uh, what it means is that when, for example, how evacuates Boston, March 76, what he does is instead of sailing back to Britain and then having to think about invading America from Portsmouth or Plymouth, which really would be logistical and undertaking by any stretch of the imagination, what he does is he actually just sails back to Halifax, which is no great distance as you can see, uh, resupplies there, gets some more troops from Britain, and then sails down to New York, pops up over the horizon. So this ability to have local bases is quite cool. Bear in mind, incidentally, that was the war the Americans weren't prepared for, how turning up again. The Americans, what the Americans, as it were, psychologically are prepared for is a short, victorious war. Okay, that's what the Americans want, a short, victorious war. And actually, they win that brilliantly. By the end of March 1776, the British had been cleared out of the 13 colonies. The war has been 
they're not necessarily particularly bad jokes. Um, the, the important thing about the loyalists are, it's not just their numbers, but the important thing about the loyalists is that they're geographically concentrated in some particular areas. Now, they're not as geographically concentrated, it's not like the American Civil War, when obviously there's a much greater geographical concentration of the two sides, so it's worth bearing in mind that there are Union, and union supporters in all of the southern states in the American Civil War. But uh, particular areas of concentration, there are very few loyalists in New England, uh, very few non loyalists in Virginia. Uh, uh, those, those are the two main strengths of the revolutionary cause. Lots of loyalists in New York, lots of loyalists in New Jersey, particularly northern New Jersey, lots of loyalists on the eastern shore of the Chesapeake in Maryland, lots of loyalists in North Carolina, stacks of loyalists in Georgia, a fair number in South Carolina. Um, and you know, these have a bit of this in mind. Uh, these people are quite as willing to die for their view of their country as, as the others are. I mean, loyalist unions took very high, took very high casualty rates, um, and you know they were an important asset, um, if you like, more important in some regions than the other, and they helped to explain the southern strategy which the British followed from 78 onwards. When once France comes into the war and the war becomes a global war for the British and to fight all over the place, they cannot afford to send new soldiers, new units. Uh, to North America. So what they have to do is think much more seriously then about winning the loyalists and using loyalist support. And that accounts for why they moved much more to a southern strategy um, from 78 onwards. Last point before we look briefly at American deficiencies. Last point is the, the gap of opportunity. Between 1775 and the summer of 1778, Britain is at war with nobody else at all. Very unusual. No war in India, no war with anybody else in Europe. So they are able to devote their entire energy to fighting in North America. Now, initially, they've got it completely and utterly wrong. The, uh, as you know, it's in military terms, in political terms as well, but in military terms, it's totally wrong in 75. The garrison is too small. They convince themselves that it's actually only a few troublemakers around Massachusetts Bay that show the strength of Massachusetts deal with the problem, uh, so that the royal governors elsewhere on the eastern seaboard are left with virtually no troops, one of the reasons why they, they, they're they so easy to push out. And, you know, Britain has a peacetime army in 75, but by the summer of 76 it is totally different. The, the force that Howe brings to initially to Staten Island is the largest force the British state had ever hitherto taken abroad at any one go. It's a big force. Um, and, you know, they can do this in 76, they can do this in 77, they can do it for the campaign in the season of 78, because the French don't come in um, till, you know, till, till, till too late to actually alter their plans for that year. So they've got this window of opportunity factor as well. Okay, totally different to the War of 1812, for example. The War of 1812, the British only try for one year of the war, which is 1814, because it's, only, it's 1814 that Napoleon abdicates for the first time. And then they were able to send a large force. Whereas in 1812 and 1813, the British don't have a large number of forces in North America. You know, they're reliant on tiny numbers of Canadians backed up with you know, the few British regulars. So, those are the British strengths. American weaknesses, well, fairly obvious. It is difficult if you are staging a revolution to complain against exaction by authoritarian governments. It's very difficult to then persuade yourself you have a new government, which if they ask, they offer you, you know, degraded currency and say to you, you should serve and you should provide, you know, your, you know, your money and your, your, your livelihood, which is very difficult to persuade them to do that. And, you know, you pick up George Washington's correspondence, which has been ex edited in a brilliant edition by the University Press of Virginia, and it is actually stuffed full of his complaints, particularly against the individual states. And it won't be surprised to hear that there essentially he is complaining about the effects of anti-authoritarianism. Because what you've got is a marked reluctance of people to go and accept that their state units are, as it were, at the disposal of some national cause. Not surprisingly, really. There is not, you know, <laughs> there's not much of a sense of commonality there. I mean, you know, I mean, remember, these colonies don't trade extensively with each other, most of them trade extensively with Britain. The amount that, for example, um, New England has in common with Georgia is not exactly notable in that period. Um, and um, it is very, very difficult.
persuade people of a commonality of interest. On top of that, it is a formidably difficult war. It is a war where people have no idea how long it's going to go on. And as you may know, during the course of the war, the actual willingness to serve decreases. The largest, not the largest year in which people were willing to fight the Brits, fight against the tyrant George III, so-called, was 1775. Okay? After that, it goes down here. And you get people, exactly the same as with the French Revolution. You know, the mass, the levy on mass, the great enthusiasm of, you know, 92, 93, 94 goes completely collapses. Uh, it's not surprising. These are not people, this is entirely understandable. It is tough. It is difficult. Um, and on top of that, it is the economic war. But the uh, war is an excellent book by the American scholar Harold Solensky on Connecticut. During the war, the Connecticut is the breadbasket state <coughs> of, the, of the war. It provides most of the food for the Continental Army. Um, and the point he is making is that the economy is under growing greater and greater pressure. I mean, he focuses, very good scholar, he focuses on things like draft animals. You know, draft animals are needed in agriculture, draft animals are needed for also pulling cannon and things like that. And simply, they are running out. You know, they, there, is, there are enormous economic and political problems. And as you will probably be aware, by the beginning of 1781, not only has there been enormous problems with the degrading of the currency, the currency depreciation, again, like other revolutions, Fed, Parliament, France, but also there is getting growing problems with the morale of individual units in the continental army. Now, as you may know, the beginning of 81, the Brits get all about it, both the uh, New Jersey line and the Pennsylvania line mutiny. Uh, now that was, un that was unusual. Usually, if soldiers in the Continental Army just didn't like what was going on, they just walked home. I mean, that's what they usually did. And remember, because of the very difficult disciplinary situation, you don't get soldiers being shot for this sort of thing. You know, so usually the soldiers just walked home. What happened in Earth, and the problem for the, for the army, the specific problem for the army, took their guns with them. That was the real reason. Um, the problem at the beginning of 81 is actually having army units mutiny. Now, mutiny because of the, they want to get paid. Um, and the British know all about this. So that what you've actually got is it's not a case that the revolution is getting steadily stronger and stronger and stronger in terms of a powerful army, still less powerful continental navy. What you've actually got is a situation in which it appears to be the case, it just comes to light appears, but it's getting steadily weaker. Uh, which means that, you know, that in a sense it encourages the gambler, the gambler strategy that you see in 81 on both sides. The British gambled that with just one more push they could end the war successfully. And the American gambled that essentially this is their chance to win. Um, now, let's try and take this a stage further. What do we mean by winning? Now, that makes it sound, sound, as I said at the beginning, a rather silly point, really, it's a rather silly question. And we all have this notion of what we mean by winning a war, and it's one that's essentially framed by World War II. Winning a war means the complete destruction of the armed forces of the other side, their unconditional surrender, and generally the occupation of most of their territory. Actually, we didn't actually do that in 45 with either Germany or Japan. When Japan surrendered most of its territory, not be, most of its conquered territory, Regained, but we had uh, destroyed much of their army, uh, and um, even more, we got their unconditional surrender. Okay. Now, that's not how most wars end. Most wars do not end with an unconditional surrender. Most wars end with a compromised peace, and that is particularly the case in the 18th century. And. What you've got to consider for both sides in this war is what they thought they could actually achieve as opposed to what they wanted to achieve. And what they wanted to achieve was, in the case of George III, the, re you know, the recreation of, of his authority, and in the case of the Americans, what 
very interesting here. It is not a revolution that is exported. It is totally different to the French, war, the French Revolution War or the Russian Revolution War. Okay. Um, still less is it, is it possible to export it to the British colonies in the West Indies, for example, because without a navy, there is no possibility of effective military operations there. So, what is going to happen up here? Well, from the British point of view, if you assume that victory means reconquering all of the 13 colonies, and they simply can't do it. Territorial mass is too great. There's no way they can do that with the army of the size they've got. But that, of course, is not what the British are trying to do. And it's a naive notion based, as I've said, on 20th century notions of victory and total war. What the British are trying to do is achieve a major victory which will encourage the other side or lead the other side to negotiate an acceptable return to authority. Isn't that practical? Well, Franklin said in a rather famous letter, now this is absolutely ridiculous, he said there is no way we'll ever negotiate with people that have burnt down our cities, he was referring there to British coastal raids on, the, on American towns, and made war of us. And what he meant specifically there was that when the Howes came out in 76, they brought with them instructions to make war and instructions to make peace. You know, the generals had authority to negotiate as well. And if you take Franklin's position, then the British were onto a non-starter. Okay, onto a non-starter. If you think that this was a war in which people were going to, you know, fight on for their hearth and home against uh, these tyrannical tyr tyr people, it's a non-starter. And that's a view which you could probably easily propound for New England. Uh, New England is a centre of um, a really a real disaffection and reaction against um, everything that the British, uh, British uh, connection stands for. Much less credible to argue that for the South. I mean, one of the most interesting things is the South Carolina campaigns in '78 and then in '80. In '78, of course, uh, the British advance across up to Charleston, um, and the Charleston authorities are willing to negotiate a return to their authority. In 1780, that's actually what happens. I mean, 1780 is quite remarkable. Um, the, um, the Americans have a very large garrison in Charleston. Um, the British expeditionary force arrives, surrounds the city, amphibious operations very skillfully mounted across the big rivers near Charleston. And the, you know, the Americans say, there's no way we're going to negotiate with these Get. The British start shelling the city, whereupon the civilian authorities place enormous pr pressure on Benjamin Lincoln to surrender. And Benjamin Lincoln does surrender, it's the biggest individual surrender in war in terms of the Americans. And after that, you know, time to South Carolina is pretty quiet. Um, and people who, many of the patriots who before the war have been very loud and eloquent about their denouncing of George III, you know, sing from a different hymn sheet. Now, what that reminds us of, the difference between New England, and after all, in New England, you virtually don't see any British soldiers apart from coastal raids from Long Island onto the Connecticut shore um, after, the, you know, after the withdrawal, um, after, after the failure of the Saratoga campaign and the withdrawal earlier from Boston. The very difference between New England and the South. And what that reminds us of is the role of contingency and counterfactuals. Now, let me talk briefly about that. There are two types of counterfactuals. Number one, counterfactualism needs more here. Number one type of counterfactualism is what I would call ridiculous counterfactualism, absurdity. It's things that could have happened, but which nobody at the time thought was going to happen, so therefore which didn't affect their judgment. All right, what sort of things am I talking about? Well, an enormous a meteorite hitting into the Atlantic, you know. Um, you could just see Bruce Willis you know, dressed up as Thomas Jefferson trying to, you know, trying to stop it. But anyway, a meteorite hitting the Atlantic in an enormous tidal wave, deluging, deluging the eastern seaboard of America. Entirely possible, it could have happened, but of course, it's, nobody thought it was going to happen. It's a counterfactual, it's not even worth considering. All right, it's more of the Eric Bondang branch of history. Um, what, on the other hand, are counterfactuals that are much more sensible to consider are the counterfactuals that actually contemporaries of the time assume. And the counterfactuals that contemporaries of the time assumed are a whole range of factors in terms of different military scenarios, different political scenarios. But one of the most important counterfactuals, and it's worth thinking about here, is the nature that what the American political historian called John Clark and many called the shaping of America, that the shaping of America would have been different. 
That's one counterfactual. It's well worth thinking about. But we tend to think of the 13 colonies as a winner-take-all war. And in the end, it was. British lost, 13 colonies becomes an independent state. Great, fine. Uh, but that, of course, was not a counterfactual that really was one that was obvious until quite late in the war. Remember, even after Yorktown, does anybody know what the great what Washington's plan was in the 1782 campaign? 1782 campaign is one nobody ever writes about. It's actually a really good book on the 1782 campaign. It's long overdue. Anybody know what Washington's plan is? You know, Washington's won Yorktown, right? The British are tottering. So what is he going to achieve? Anybody know? Right, well, I'll tell you. What Washington plans to do is to capture, you know, end the war on a great, great high, capture the British base, New York City. And what, does he achieve it? No, of course he doesn't. There's no way that it is within the capacity of the American military to capture New York City. Just that there's no way which, which is, that it's within its capacity to capture Charleston. At the very end, it is still going to have to be a compromise peace. Because the Americans are strong enough to deny the British victory. What they are not strong enough, this is no criticism, it's a bloody difficult task against the strongest power in the world. What they are not strong enough to do is to kick the British out. Okay? So, you have got multiple counterfactuals. One of the multiple, and let alone to capture the Floridas or capture Canada. Um, Floridas, as you probably know, goes to whom at the end of the war? Spain. Yeah, there's no way the Americans. Um, uh, the, um, the one possible counterfactual is an a area of this area, Florida, South Carolina, and, and Georgia, all going a different way to the north. Another counterfactual is, of course, a very different thing for the old northwest, which again, the American penetration of is limited. The major power of the old northwest are native American tribes, most of which are aligned with the Brits. It is by no means clear which direction we're going to go. Let alone the real fun political counterfactuals. Now let's play this political counterfactual one just through, just very briefly, to remind you of how history could have been very, very different. Let's say the British had won, whatever we mean by winning for a bit, a minute. Let's say the winning had been so that people had returned by a process of negotiation to a vague dominion status, the kind of thing that Canada is to end up getting, Australia is to end up getting in the 19th century. Well, you come into the beginning of the 19th century, and do you know this wretched lot of Brits, do you know what they do? They sit there in Westminster, and they pass an act through Parliament that strikes the very foundation of the economy of much of America and dramatically reduces the economic value of a lot of American society. And obviously we are going to have to rebel against that. Obviously we're going to have to fight again against the Brits again. What piece of legislation am I talking about? Well, actually the abolition, abolition of the first sentence of the slave trade. Okay, the abolition of slavery comes later, it comes in the 1830s. And it's worth bearing in mind the extent to which, in other words, the way in which the severing of the link, when it occurs, is quite important to the actual nature of the people culture of America that develops. That had that severing of the link occurred different, uh, differently, as in the 1800s, which is entirely possible, there's no inherent reason why the revolution should have broken out in 1775, one would have had a very, very different political culture and foundation origin of America. 
And it doesn't really matter if you were able to build up a bigger kill ratio. Okay, I mean, let me give you an obvious example. Let's take the American Civil War. In the American Civil War, the southern white males were willing to take 25% casualties in killed, 25% in injured, before they surrendered, before they lost. That's phenomenally high figures. It's the highest figure for any American war other than Native Americans threatening genocide. Okay? Now, what that reminds us of is there is nothing fixed which says to you, thus far people are willing to fight and then we know we can beat them. Okay? The British, in many respects, should have won this war. Uh, and the interesting thing is they didn't. Not that their loss was inevitable, but that they didn't because, as I said, the Americans were not willing to accept their calculus. Last point. It's very easy. I recently brought out, and I'm very mindful of this because I recently brought out a book on America as a military power from 1775 to 1865. It's very easy to um, forget the extent to which war was important in the framing of, the, of American history. Um, you know, I know that sounds ridiculous. We, we all know about the Civil War, we all know about the American War of Independence, but in a sense, there is a sense that these are exceptional. These are episodes along the way, that America is fundamentally a non-militaristic society. And linked to that is the idea that, of course, when wars come, they're won by the militia, and that essentially America has a very small regular military until the 1940s, which is true, as have a very small regular military until the 1940s, and that therefore war is largely eccentric to the course of American history. That's not true. I think what one can more fairly say is that America, like other states, has been a state which engaged in war quite frequently, but without it having, apart from in the American and the Civil War without it having traumatic effects for American society. Okay? It was only in those two wars that large areas of America were occupied by outside powers. The South during the American Civil War, and obviously parts of America by the Brits in this war, but the thought was now for instance. You know, that's very unusual. So in other words, it's not so much that America has a history of peace, it's that its military history has been singularly beneficial from its point Denied. And ultimately, that really rests not so much on anything that's marvelous in the water or anything. What it ultimately rests on is the nature of geography. If you think about it, geographically, America is very fortunate in its neighbors. You take the American Revolution and contrast it with the French Revolution. The French Revolution started off with similarly utopian aspirations, uh, naive if you want to call them that, but utopian aspirations. Of course, the French found themselves neighboring, threatening states which were not willing to go away, including Britain, incidentally. Um, in the case of America, one was in a very fortunate position of being able to expand, particularly fortunate that once America became independent, the European states engaged in a protracted civil war between 1792 and 1815. You know, the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars are, in a sense, a form of European civil war. And that was the period in which America really consolidated itself. So in other words, there was an element of chance, an element of serendipity in early American military history that is worth thinking about. And the very last point is this. You tend to think about this war as a war of Americans against the Brits. Bear in mind it was also an American civil war. It is, in fact, the first major American civil war. There have been minor ones like Bacon. Earlier. This is the first major American civil war. And if you see it in that light, as well as a war between the British states and Americans, as well as a world war between Britain and the French, Britain and the Spaniards, you start to understand much more of the complexity and fascination of this struggle. Well, I hope that's of interest. I'm happy to try and answer any questions you might throw.